Welcome everyone. This is Megan Mitchell, the founder of Agents of Change Social Work Test Prep. And we are very excited today to have a special guest to share her expertise with us. Um, as you know, for Social Work Month, we are featuring um, awesome leaders in the field and we're kind of picking their brain and getting some advice from them. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Catherine Moore to our podcast today. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right in. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you are doing in the field. Yeah, so my name is Catherine Moore. I'm a licensed clinical social worker out of sunny Southern California. And I've been social working since 2009 when I got my bachelor's, uh, went on to get my master's in 2015. And since then, mostly been working in the field as a medical social worker. And then in 2020 of January, January, 2020, I started a podcast because I actually almost quit social work because I was so fed up with the toxic narratives. I felt like I wasn't making like the change that I really wanted to. I felt burnt out, just exhausted, overwhelmed. And I was just so fed up with the industry that this was our norm, quote unquote, norm to be expected to, to burn out. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so, I'm, okay, we'll get into burnout later, but <laughs> So with the <laughs> podcast, I really wanted to flip the script on these toxic narratives that we have in our field. And so that was, that's the social workers rise podcast. And from there, I went on to create a course because I really wanted to give more support mm -hmm. to those new social workers in the field. Cause that's really where I struggled. We burn out after three years now with the pandemic, I'm willing to bet it's, it's a lot shorter, like six months to a year, uh, which is terrible. So I really wanted to give those new social workers extra support. So we made the clinical essentials for the future therapist course. And then from there, when I was ready to pursue clinical licensure, when I was qualified in California, I was doing research and I really wanted to dig in and get more information. And um, I wanted one place where I could just go and find all the tools for clinical supervisors and how do I market myself once, once I'm able to provide this service? Like, how do people know about me? And there, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So the resources for clinical supervision are scarce, which I was appalled because <laughs> this is the foundation of our, of our career, of the whole industry, right? This is where mm -hmm. we start our, our learning, working with clients, getting that those clinical skills working on ourselves so that we're effective and we're not causing harm. So I was very upset to find that this resource didn't exist. I said, screw it. I'm going to make it. Yeah. So in 20, what was it? 2021, we started on the venture of the rise directory and we launched it last year, 20 was it August August, 2021, we had a soft launch. And so we're really creating the go-to resource for clinical supervisors. So that is me. I'm podcaster, medical social worker, founder of Rise Directory. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think that clinical supervision, like you said, the resources are scarce. And a lot of times people, um, a lot of people ask me, is it just going to be included in whatever job I take? And I'm like, no, not necessarily. So um, I think a lot of times people kind of get into situations where they're either not getting a, the appropriate supervision that they need, or it's not a good fit. So I think it's really important that people invest in finding someone that's going to really hone in on those skills. Um, I was lucky enough to have a great clinical supervisor, but I know that's not the case for everyone. And like you said, that's really the foundation. So if you're la if you're missing that that um, good support, um, you're really going to have a hard time with burnout because you're you're maybe not equipped with some of those skills that are really necessary in the field. So that's great that you. Yeah found that need and you're, you're building that resource around it. So that's awesome. Yeah. And it, it goes into test prep too, because yes. clinical supervision is where you can process 
these interventions that you're learning, the different subjects, you know, everything and see it play out in real life as opposed to just studying for it for a test. And I always tell people that's thank you for touching on that. I tell people like your clinical supervisor should be assisting you in this process at some level, right? Like you should be talking about the code of ethics. You should be talking about the different KSAs. So um, for those out there listening, like please, please, please utilize your clinical supervisors. They've done this before. Um, so I think that's a really good resource. Um, and I tell people definitely tap into that um, because they have experience in that. So it's really, really important as well. Right. And, so, and so I hear some really awesome stories about supervisors that are very supportive and helpful through that process, which I think is just a really good gift to the field. Yeah. And I think it could help if you brought, I mean, if you have the Agents of Change test prep course, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you could bring that material to clinical supervision yep, absolutely. and talk about it and talk about what it looks like in real life. How does it play out in your agency? You know, everything like that. I'm sure your supervisor would be relieved to have extra right. materials. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. So if you have material, bring it to your supervisors, talk through those tough ethical dilemmas, talk through those tough cases that you see in the question stem. So Yes, very, very important that you utilize your clinical supervisors. Um, so uh, my next question is, you know, you've been in the field for quite some time. You have your um, BSW and your MSW. What is one lesson you've learned either personally or professionally throughout um, your time in the field? Well, this lesson would be both personal okay. and professional uh, because we really are, we're human right? We're humans who happen to be social workers. <laughs> so the number one lesson that I learned is to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and to make yourself a priority and keep that balance. I used to tell myself when I was in my early days, I just love my job so much. There's no way I'm going to get burnt out on helping people. Oh my gosh. It just got to the point where I felt like I was helping and serving to the point where there's just nothing left of me. Yeah. And I felt, you know, who, who is here to help me everywhere I go, people had questions or requests of me. And I just, it, it just got so, so much. Cause you're constantly giving energy. I'm an introvert. So I like my alone time. So serving people and helping people and making those conversations and being in some uncomfortable situations where you don't know people, you don't you question if you're safe or not. It's, it's exhausting over time. And I got to the point where I was just so, I was working all the time. I didn't have the energy or the motivation to have fun, to spend time with my family. I ignored my finances because that stressed mm -hmm. me out. I didn't have the energy to, to look at that. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So definitely to keep that balance, no one is going to do it for you. You have to make yourself the priority because hopefully we're in this for the long run. Right. This is a marathon, not a sprint, hopefully for, for us. That's my goal. Uh, but to just take care of yourself and keep that balance, you know, work, work the time that you need to work, but also set, set aside that time for family, for loved ones, for fun, for movement, for all of the things that help bring your stress level back down. I think that's so important. And I think that during social work month this month, I see a lot of that messaging um, coming out and it's more than just self-care, like, oh, get a massage or have a bubble, bubble bath, right? It's making yourself a priority is really, really important. And um, I too, I've been in schools for over 10 years and I was to the point, I don't know if you similarly felt like this in the medical field, I'm giving so much of myself and I feel helpless. I mm -hmm. feel like I'm actually not effective at all. And that's not a good feeling to feel like you're pouring everything into something and you don't feel effective. Um, so that that's when I was like, okay, I need to take a step back. And like, like you said, find balance, because at the end of the day, this is a job, right? I love what I do, but it's a job. And like you said, we're humans, we have interests, like a job is just one part of like, I like to say it's like a pie chart and it should just be one piece of the pie because we are whole beings and we have so many other things going on in our life that I think when we're burnt out, we neglect, we neglect to do those things that are so important to our well being. So I definitely agree that the burnout is real. And I think it's across different 
um, settings. And I like that you talked about feeling exhausted because I think people, you know, think, oh, it's just, you'll be, you know, mentally exhausted. There are days when you are physically exhausted because you're giving so much energy and so much of your energy to the job, to the clients. Um, it is physically exhausting. I would come home and take a nap every day after, um, you know, a, a, a day at, in a school because I just was so tired. I could barely keep my eyes open. So I think that's really important to be in tune with what's going on. It's probably not normal that I was so tired, but I was definitely, now that I see it, I was burnt out. Yeah, definitely. And you listed a lot of signs of burnout, feeling ineffective, mm -hmm. feeling overwhelmed, feeling exhausted. And our brain uses a lot of energy. Yes. <laughs> and that is, that is our main tool for our work is our brains and our minds. So if you think about a mechanic, if they're using the same wrench all day, and they see it kind of getting rickety and raggedy, they're not gonna keep using it and cranking away. They're gonna give it a break, fix it, get a new one, you know? <laughs> so while we can't get a new mind or brain, we definitely need to be massaging it and taking good care of it. And, um, and just, you know, being aware of how the heck are we feeling because mm -hmm. it's, it's true. And our brains take up so much energy that yes, it's physically exhausting. Um, I like that analogy of the mechanic with the wrench. Um, in test prep, sometimes people are like, I keep studying, 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 and then they may go on and they're not successful. And I'm like, did you give your, like, did you put so much pressure and so much energy into studying that your brain was not able to process the information? And sometimes it's, you know, our brain can only handle so much. So I tell people, you really need to break down your studying into manageable. You, you can't just fully, fully, fully only commit to studying, right? We have other parts of our lives and a lot of people are working jobs. So you need to make sure that you are mentally um, in a space that you're able to commit to studying. Like sometimes people have so much going on in their life and I'm like, it's okay that now's not a, the best time for you to prepare for the exam because you're just not hundred percent and that's okay. So I think that a lot of times we, I just have to remind people to give yourself grace. You are human, right? Life happens, things, things come up and just um, making sure that you are in the mental space and you're ready to commit like when you are fully present in all areas of your life. So I think that that's really important. Yeah, definitely. Cause this isn't a high school test. I mean, this right. is information that you need for your career. People's lives are depending on you to be efficient in this material. So we're not trying to commit it to short-term memory. We want this exactly. to really sink in and to know the information. And when we're able to really think clearly and have a well-rested mind, that's when the magic happens. Very, 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 very true. Um, my next question is, so we talked about a, a lesson that you've learned in the field. Is there a professional tool, I'll put that in quotes, a tool or something that you would suggest other social workers utilize who may be new to the field? something you could recommend? Yeah, well, I would definitely recommend the RISE directory. Check it out yeah. because if you're pursuing clinical licensure, chances are you're in clinical supervision. There are tools in the resource section that will help you with clinical supervision. So you, you need to have a contract with your supervisor. You need to have an agreement of what you're gonna work on, your care plan goals. So all of those are in the resources section. And additionally, there are some therapy tools in there, like for CBT, for clinical interventions to help put names or uh, interventions for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it really helps to professionalize your documentation and your writing to where you're not just sitting there for an hour. Like, what the heck did I just do? <laughs> right, right. Um, that's very, very helpful. I do have another question. So say someone's already in clinical supervision and they're just feeling like maybe they're not getting out of supervision what they want, or do you have any suggestions for how they could approach their supervisor or, and maybe they have nothing documented, right? I always tell people you have to have things documented, but do you have any advice? Cause I do know that sometimes this is an issue that comes up is, you know, maybe they're going really strong for the first couple months and then people get busy and maybe supervision's not what they thought it was gonna be or their supervisor's not as, um, making the time and making it a priority. So do you have any suggestions for people that may be in that situation? Yeah, first just acknowledge that it's gonna be a super uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. 
but necessary because this is your time. This is your career. This is your future that you need to, again, make yourself a priority and stand up for yourself and just be honest, you know, say, use the, we can go back to the, I feel this way. (laughs) Using those skills that we learned in that uncomfortable conversation. Yes, exactly. And you could even approach it as far as, you know, I, uh, I really, or because I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it where it's like, I had these, I wasn't really sure what to expect with clinical supervision. Mm -hmm. And now, oh, here we go. And now that we're doing clinical supervision and we've been doing it for a little while, these are the types of areas that I feel would be best that we talk about. What do you think about that? And just bringing it like that, um, laying it there on the table, expect to be uncomfortable, but you need to be courageous in this moment and just say, you know, um, or you could say, these topics are are really the areas that I want to focus on. Can we, can we talk about this? Do you Mm -hmm. think that we can make these a priority? I love that. And I think that sometimes we, there is a power dynamic sometimes in supervision, right? So I think sometimes people are afraid like, oh, this is going to negatively impact me. But like you said, this is, this is something that is crucial to your development as a social worker. So it's really important to have those courageous conversations and to, to practice your advocacy skills, because if you're not going to advocate um, for yourself, no one, like you said, only you can advocate for yourself. So um, I would say similarly to what you said, don't let it go on as a pattern for so long that you're not getting what you need. You need to yeah. address it um, and have those conversations. They might not even know that that was like on the radar, right? We want to also assume best intent, like they're busy too. So maybe just bringing that up and bringing it to the forefront of their mind, I think is a really good idea for people because they're, they're busy too. Right. Um, so just bringing that to their mind and advocating, I think is really important. Yeah. And I, I think there's, there's a difference between complaining and bringing solutions. So if you're going to be approaching this conversation, definitely bring solutions with you and say, you know, here's an example of of something that we can talk about today. So come prepared for clinical supervision. Don't expect your supervisor to do it all. Um, And then if they're not receptive to this conversation, then maybe we need to start looking for a different supervisor. You know, you're not stuck with that one, which is the beautiful thing about the RISE directory is you can find someone else in your community that hopefully is within the same industry as you and local in your state so that you can start to get those, those quality supervision hours. And does the rise directory have people from all over the United States? So it's not specific to a certain region. Right. Yep. And we're just getting started. So we're adding new people every single day. So Mm -hmm. if there's no one that fits your needs right now, definitely check back later. Awesome. Talking about burnout, stress, all of the things that, you know, we've touched on. How do you practice self-care or manage your stress? That is a great question. And I really try to just be mindful of how I'm feeling. And I used to feel guilty if I was tired because I have, I I think a lot of us, especially, you know, the field being 80% women, we have a lot of expectations that we're just going to do it all because no one else is going to do it right. (laughs) Uh, And that might be, it might be true to some extent, but you know, done is better than perfect a lot of times. So I've just been really mindful of how I'm feeling. What does my body really need? Do I need to take a nap? Okay. Let's take a nap if we can. Right. Um, Do we need to go for a walk? Let's do that. Do we need a girl's night out for some fun? Let's do that. So try to be mindful of how I'm feeling, what I need, and keep that balance with with uh, everything that we talked about, right? With yeah. the career, with the family, and having fun. I like that you brought up not feeling guilty because that's something that I definitely struggle with. Like, even if I take a sick day, I feel guilty. And I'm like, wait, that's actually crazy. Like, that's what sick days are for. Like, I shouldn't be going in to work when I'm not feeling a hundred percent. So like, I think that's definitely something that a lot of people in the field, like have to kind of change that narrative as like, no, this like, you are entitled to put yourself as a priority. 
um, without feeling that guilt. But I, I just think also a lot of industries, right? There's this like expectation that you you just come and you you even if you're not feeling good, you are committed to your job. And it's just by taking a sick day or a, a mental health day or taking time for yourself does not mean you're not committed. It means that you are committed and you're you want to get yourself to be a hundred percent. So that guilt exactly. piece is definitely real. <laughs> yes, it is real, but with practice, it can be less. <laughs> yes. Um, awesome. So the burning question, our million dollar question, um, obviously we are aspiring to create change agents in the field. How are you an agent of change? So this is a great question. And to be honest, I didn't, when you said the question, I didn't know how to answer it. So I Googled agent and change. And it was interesting because agent is a person who um, advocates on behalf mm -hmm. of other people or communities or organizations and change is, you know, of course, inspiring change. Right. Uh, and so I feel like I've always been an agent of yeah. change. I mean, I've always been kind of born that way. Even as a kid, I would, <laughs> I would, my grandmother hated it, but I would take in the neighborhood stray cats <laughs> and because I thought it was so messed up that they're just out there in the cold. <laughs> Um, don't take in straight cats. It's not a good idea, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but it's just always been within me. And so even now, whenever I see that there's gaps in the system, that there are needs that need to be fulfilled, having that creativity and that courage to say, what can I do about it? And a lot of times I see people who Every day I see social workers who say, you know, this isn't working right and these people aren't being served and there's this problem over here. I say, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? What is a solution? And a lot of times we have that one particular area that really irks us. That is your sweet spot. That is the place that you need to make change because that is your calling. That is your purpose. That is what you are extra passionate about. And you know the solutions already, you know what needs to be done, let's make it happen. And it does take creativity and grit and courage to do that though. Thank you. Um, I think as social workers, there is something in our being that makes us change agents. So I definitely agree with that. Like it just is part of us um, in one way or another. Like there's so many stories like you that growing up, you know, you were involved with bringing in the stray cats. I was always doing volunteer stuff in my community when I was younger. So like you said, it is, it's a part of who we are. It's part of our fabric and our being. Um, well, thank you, Catherine. That was so, so, so insightful. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community. I will definitely leave your information. Is there any way that people could get in contact with you or check out your podcast or the directory? Um, yeah. so they can stay in touch. Yeah. So the podcast is social workers rise. I am on Instagram as social workers rise, uh, LinkedIn. I can give you the link I'm yeah. on there. And then we do have a rise directory, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. So it's at rise directory. Awesome. So and definitely I will, connected. yeah, I will definitely post all that information too. So listeners can tune in and check you out, but thank you so much for taking the time to um, talk with us today and share your expertise. We really appreciate it. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Thank you.